Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining slash attending slash watching my talk today. My name is Charlie and I'll be talking about lower bounds for max cut and H3 graphs using a method inspired by semi-definite programming. This is joint work with Alexander Kola, Ray Lee, Nitya Mani, Benny Sudikov, and Luca Trevisa. The first thing we need to do is recall some definitions introduce, and introduce some notation. A cut of a graph is a bar partition of its vertices into two different sets. The value of a cut is the number of edges that cross this bipartition. There's the number of edges such that each endpoint is in a different side of the partition. The maximum cut value of a graph is the maximum number of edges that cross over all such bipartitions. You can also think of this as the size of the largest bipartite subgraph in G in terms of the number of edges. There's a lot that we could say about F of G. For example, you might recall that finding f of g for input g is actually np hard, it is the maximum cut problem. However, there are known approximation algorithms that achieve the best bound we believe possible, assuming the unique games conjecture. I bring this up because we actually are inspired by one of these rounding approximation schemes, uh, and we will actually use it in one of our proofs. However, today I'm not going to focus on algorithmic complexity theoretic or even in approximability results. And instead I'm going to focus on bounds for f of g where I fix g to be from specific class of family, namely h free graphs. The first result I wanna talk about though are actually for general g. So for general g, it's not very hard to show that every graph has a f of g bound of e over two. How you show this is you take a random partitioning of the vertices, and then you realize that every edge has probability one half of being cut. This then proves that there must be a cut of size at least e over two. This can actually be improved for arbitrary graphs to e over two plus root eight e plus one minus one over eight, result of Edmund in 73. This result is tight for any complete graph with an odd number of vertices. That is, any graph with an odd number of vertices such that every two vertices share an edge. It's natural then to ask, well, what happens when we know our graph is not complete or very much not complete? Namely, what happens when we know our graph is sparse or does not contain some subgraph H? One example of such a class of graphs would be triangle free graphs. Alon showed in 96 that for any triangle free graph, f of g is at least e over two plus e to the four fifths. They actually also showed that this is tight up to a constant factor in front of the second term, which we would call the surplus. This introduces the question that motivates our work. What can we say about the surplus, again, f of g minus e over two, when g is h free? for other H's. Now, Alon also showed more recently that when, or along with some co-authors, that when H is equal to CR for R equal four, six, or 10, or when we consider the bipartite complete graph K2S or K3S with one side being of size two or three, you can also get some non-trivial improvement over E over two. It's worth pointing out explicitly that we care about the surplus because again, we already showed that every graph f of g is at least e over two. So the question is natural to ask, how much better can we do than e over two? This brings us to our first result, theorem 1.1. This theorem is used to produce many of our other results and shows an interesting insight into how we can generalize known results such as the one we just mentioned. In this case, what we say is that if you have a graph G such that for every vertex you can assign it a subset of its neighborhood and you can construct an epsilon I that is strictly less or less than or equal to one over root the size of this set, then you're guaranteed to get a surplus of at least the sum of epsilon I VI over two pi minus the sum of E epsilon I epsilon J intersect VI intersect VJ over two for all vertices I and J that are neighbors of each other in G. Now, one way to think about this, if you parse it correctly, is the surplus is going to be equal to basically a gain for every vertex, with vertex which is the second term, plus or minus rather, a loss for the intersection that is the collision between two vertices that have overlap in the neighborhood you chose. And we're gonna demonstrate that actually, when you consider the case of triangle free, or when you consider the case of arbitrary deregular graphs, you're able to use this theorem to produce two already known, but interesting results. In the special case of a graph being triangle free, we can actually set VI to be the entire neighborhood of the vertex I and epsilon I to be equal one over root the size of that set. What we get then if we plug it into the previous theorem 1.1 1. or 1.1 is that F of G has to always be greater than E over two plus some constant C 
times the sum of the root of the degree. And this was a known result of Shearer. However, this, it's worth pointing out that theorem 1.1 is proved in a very much easier to analyze, analyze way than the previous result of Shearer. We actually don't need to have the strong guarantee of triangle freeness. With a little more work, using theorem 1.1, we can actually also get the following result, which says that as long as you know that the total number of triangles in the graph is not too large, then we're guaranteed that we can actually get still a similar bound. Namely, we can get f of g is at least one half plus c for some constant c, epsilon times e, where epsilon again is allowed to be at most one over root d. This result was already somewhat known, but it actually improves upon a result of Alain et al, where they showed that they could get a similar bound so long as they knew that every, every vertex was incident that was participating in few triangles. Our result implies that, but here we only need a global bound that says the total number of triangles is manageable. The way we actually prove theorem 1.1 is kind of interesting. Usually these theorems are proved using some sort of probabilistic argument and then demonstrating that either the expected value is at least what we want or that there must exist something with non-zero probability. We actually don't venture too far away from that, but we use tools from some known algorithm and approximation algorithms that make the job a little bit easier. Namely, we use the following max cut uh, SDP formulation, semi-definite program formulation. And what we do is we demonstrate a feasible point that is a point such that we have the second criteria met that has good value. We then use an existing rounding scheme, much like the Goins-Williamson uh, rounding scheme that was used to get the best known approximation for max cut to produce a integral point that is an actual feasible cut of value very similar to the one we want. Now that we have this result that says, so long as I have very few triangles in my graph, I can find a good cut, we're gonna turn our attention to H-free graphs. Suppose that G is an H-free graph. If G also has very few triangles, then we can use the previous result to get a bound that we probably can't improve upon, namely the one over root D relative surplus. However, if, D is not, if G does not have very few triangles, then we're going to actually have to do this kind of iterative decomposition. And what we do here is that we prove first that if a graph G doesn't have very few triangles, then there must exist one vertex that has many triangles in its neighborhood. That is, it participates in many triangles. We identify that vertex, for example, V in the image here, and then we look at its neighborhood. Now, if it, V has a lot of triangles, then we know its neighborhood is going to have a lot of edges. In fact, we can show that the number of edges inside of its neighborhood is going to be significantly or at least noticeably greater than the number of edges leaving its neighborhood. What we do is we remove the neighborhood and put it into another part of the graph. And we repeat this process so long as the original part of the graph has too many triangles for us to apply theorem 1.1 or namely really the corollary we just discussed. What's nice about this is that in the end, we're left with the following. We're left with a graph that we know has few triangles, and so we can use our previous corollary. We're also left with several other disjoint graphs that we know are neighbors of a given vertex. Now, the neighbor of a vertex in an H-free graph is guaranteed not to have a graph H prime as a subgraph, where H prime is any graph produced by removing a vertex of H. If you are careful about understanding H, then you know that H prime is actually going to be an interesting class of families. So for example, if your graph is guaranteed to be K4 free, that is not to have a click of size four, then you know the neighborhood of any vertex can't have a triangle. So in that particular case, we would be able to apply theorem 1.1 again to all of the satellite graphs, all of these little neighborhood graphs, and then what we do as a final step is we take the cut that we found in each one of these induced subgraphs and we combine them in order to leverage that we can actually guarantee to cut at least half of the edges that go between them. To guarantee that we can cut half of the edges that go between them, we basically just reproduce that simple probabilistic argument from the first slide. That is, we randomly take a partition with respect to the already existing partitions. Combining all of this together, and since we knew that most of the edges were either in the original graph or in each of the small components, we're able to bound or get a non-trivial surplus for a graph, provided that we know some good bound for the H prime free graphs. The following slide is actually gonna be where I'll put that up, but it might take a little bit of time to parse. Uh, I hope that this gave a little more intuition as to what we're doing. So lemma 3.5 is the lemma that actually captures what I was trying to explain in the previous slide. That is, it shows that if I have a guarantee for H prime free graphs, 
then if I, H is produced by adding a vertex to H prime, we can then extend the guarantee from H prime graphs to H. Now this does come at a loss if, you, if you're careful about it. And so eventually, if you keep reducing this, you will uh, ultimately end up with convergence to a very trivial bound, and again, namely one half uh, plus C to the one over times one over D uh, plus M, which you can produce, um, which is already a known result and not too hard to show using existing methods. However, there are many interesting cases where just knowing some trivial bound again for let's say triangle freeness will get you some non-trivial bound for let's say K for free graphs. Uh, and likewise, we can take pretty much any of the results of a lawn at all, and we're able to extend them and improve upon some other results for H free graphs. One particularly interesting case is the click free graph. Now, what you can already kind of see here is that if we iteratively apply the same technique, we can keep amplifying and bootstrap up for an arbitrary uh, R, we can find a good bound or a bound for KR free. And if you do that, you actually do get good results. However, we're able to show that pretty much after uh, a constant number of steps, it's sufficient to just consider instead this somewhat more trivial argument where we instead use for our smaller graphs, not uh, recursing on what we already know, but instead using a bound on the maximum cut value based on the fact that the chromatic number of these graphs should be bounded. And this is how we get what is our, uh, another one of our takeaway results, theorem 1.3, which says that for R greater than equal to three, since R equal and R equal to two are not very interesting, there must exist a constant uh, that depends on R such that you get F of G greater than one half C over D to this somewhat interesting function. But what you'll notice is that when R equals three, this does equal um, uh, root D uh, times E. Now, we can actually show something better for the R equals four case and potentially for the R equals five case, but these methods don't match up with what we conjecture to be true necessarily. And they just require a little bit more uh, finer analysis and combinations of some of the tools we already demonstrated. So after doing the study and looking at it, we believe that the following should be true, that for any H, regardless of what it is, there should exist a constant that depends on that H, such that for any H-free D-degenerate graph, or max degree D if you must, with M edges, the surplus is going to be of the order CM over root D. This would match the triangle case, but none of the other cases for click free, for example, quite get down to root D. In fact, I think the best we can do is something of the order D to the four fifths or something. So it's quite a bit of a gap there, but we believe you should be able to do this provided you can find the right way to maybe use our method to decompose or strengthen some of the results from the SDP possibly. It's also interesting to point out, and we demonstrate in our paper that the conjecture 1.4 would actually prove conjecture 1.5 uh, which has a similar flavor to it, albeit written slightly different, uh, which is a known conjecture from Elan from O3. In conclusion, we have a number of interesting theorems. Namely, we're able to demonstrate two really useful tools that allow us to basically break any graph into smaller pieces such that one piece is guaranteed to be triangle free or have very few triangles. We're then able to demonstrate that having few triangles allows us to find an edge, a cut which can also be constructed by the way. And likewise, in the other components, we're able to show in this decomposition that there are many different, uh, or there are a lot of edges that are actually inside the part and not crossing the part. And this method could be used and it has, is used in our paper to produce a lot of different results for different H-free graphs. As I said before, it includes some extensions to what is already known from Alon et al. And also some additional improvements of our own. And you can find most of those results in the appendix of our paper uh, and in the forthcoming extended version of our paper. And so with that, I will conclude. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for listening, watching, or, or, or even um, attending. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, my address is here and it's also on the paper. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, again, thank you for your time. Okay, are there any questions? Yeah, so, 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 so let me ask. Uh, it, it seems rather astonishing that semi-definite programming can be used for low bands. Uh, ha, has it been used for that purpose before in other contexts? Not that I'm aware of, and I should be a little bit careful to, to, to make it a little bit more clear. It's kind of more of an inspired technique. It's the rounding scheme that's used from the semi-definite. Like, indeed, we're kind of just demonstrating a feasible point, which could map to just coming up with a uh, interesting distribution. So it, 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 it's more the rounding technique, which of course people kind of use where you, you know, find some probabilistic distribution and then you use some 
some different algorithm to do about it. So it, we don't actually have to solve the SDP, for example, although if you want to make it constructive, you could potentially argue that you want to use the iterative um, approach. But yeah, so it's it, I, I'm not aware of anyone using it for a lower bound so much as, again, it's just a kind of an interesting way to look at coming up with this feasible plan. Or I think interesting. I won't put the words in there. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah, then we have a little break. Uh, thank you again.